On behalf of all of us here in the sanctuary of Eastminster United Church in Belleville, Ontario, welcome to those who have been sharing all of our service through our DVD ministry and to those who have found us on the internet or who are listening to the podcast of this message. We hope and pray that whatever else is happening in your life today, the time you're spending with us in this way will be a blessing. Uh, we listened to um, a bit of the Gospel of Matthew, a portion of the fifth chapter, just after uh, we have uh, heard about those wonderful teachings of Jesus, which we call the Beatitudes. And then Jesus said this. He said, you are the salt of the earth. And then he said, you are the light of the world. As we reflect on those powerful words, let's ask for God's blessing. Let's pray. Grant, O oh God, that as we spend this little time reflecting on words of ancient text, we will be so mindful of, of our own reality, all of the things that are happening in our lives, all of the things that we may have yet to face in our lives, so that we will accept the help you give us now. And we ask for that help, O oh God, that you will bless us in both the speaking and in the hearing, so that the word that is heard will be your own. Amen. In this winter of our discontent, the snow keeps falling, the wind keeps blowing, and the accidents keep piling up on roads and highways across North America. This week was no exception, as uh, multi-vehicle accidents closed Highway 401. And here is an example of that, June. A powerful example of what was going on. Um, this is the highway between uh, Trenton and uh, Glen Miller Road, closed on Wednesday afternoon with all of these wrecks. 115 vehicle wreck that closed the westbound lanes in um, this part of the country. You can see the, the, the mess of it. And uh, if you look closely in just a moment, You'll see me, <laughs> or, or at least, actually it doesn't look too badly damaged from this far away. That's me in the middle of all of those tractor trailers. The great blessing is that no serious injuries were reported. The only serious damage was to vehicles, including my own. But so it was that I spent five hours in that mess trying to keep warm since one of the two crashes my car suffered broke the window in the front passenger door. It took that long for police, firemen, and tow trucks to clear a path so that we could even begin to get off the highway. And it went on and on and on and on and on. But June, I think we've seen enough. And then I had to drive to the Trenton YMCA where the OPP had established a staging area to write up the accident reports. You might be able to imagine my state of mind when I finally got there. I was cold and wet and stiff and sore and dead tired. All I wanted to do was to get home providing my broken car would make it that far. And now I had to play 20 questions with a police officer. But, but it was one of those moments when God chooses to surprise us with grace. I expected to be met by, you know, one of those typically unsmiling, hard-nosed, no-nonsense cops. But instead, I was invited to sit down with an officer who began by asking how I was feeling, to check if I was hurt in any way. He apologized for having to delay me so long and then proceeded with courtesy, respect, and gentle encouragement. Just before we were finished, he asked what I did for a living. And when I told him, he said that he is a member of Grace United Church in Napanee and that he ran the youth program there a few years ago. As I was driving home, it struck me that I had just been given an excellent illustration for this sermon. Here was a Christian who, while he was doing his job as a police officer, 
acted in such a way that he was, for me at least, salt of the earth and light for the world. Jesus said, you are salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. To preach on such a text, the greatest challenge for me is to find something new to say. Those words are so familiar, they've become part of the, of the popular vernacular. Now, there's always value in repeating an old idea, in reaffirming ancient wisdom, but we should be no less willing to hear something new. And that's the challenge of preaching on such a familiar text. My Wednesday encounter with salty illumination reminded me of what I already knew, but it also gave me a brand new and expanded appreciation of what it means to be salt of the earth and light for the world. Now in this age of, of excess, when hypertension is epidemic, we're as likely to think of salt as a problem, as a blessing, but for those to whom Jesus spoke those words, salt was valued without qualification. It was associated with purity, derived as it was from what those folks believed to be the two purest of all things, the sun and the sea. It was regularly used in their offerings as a most sacred sacrifice to be like salt. They understood exactly what Jesus meant. To be like salt is to be pure. In his commentary on Matthew's Gospel, William Barclay describes the implications of that for us. He said, No Christian can depart from the standards of strict honesty. No Christian can think lightly of the lowering of moral standards. No Christian can allow himself the tarnished and suggestive jests which are so often a part of social conversation. Did you hear about the guy who went into confession with a turkey in his arms? Forgive me, Father, he said, for I have sinned. I stole this turkey. Will you take it from me to, to free me of my guilt? Certainly not, said the priest. As penance, you are to return it to the one from whom you stole it. I tried, said the guy. I tried, but he refused. Father, what shall I do? And the priest said, well, if what you say is true, then it is all right for you to keep the turkey. The man said, thanks very much, thank you, and he ran off. After confession, the priest returned to his residence, and when he walked into the kitchen, he discovered somebody had stolen his turkey. <laughs> what could be more precious, more pure, in this age of chronic scandal, duplicity, and sin, sin that often takes the form of spin, what could be more pure than someone who is willing to do what is right, to say what is true, no matter how easy or commonplace it may be to do otherwise, no matter how tempting the loopholes of prevarication? Now, the contemporaries of Jesus would also know the value of salt as a preservative. What we accomplish with freezing or vacuum sealing was for thousands of years done with salt. One of my grandfathers was a Newfoundland fisherman at a time when the fish were dried on, on flakes like these. They call them flakes. Next slide, June. Those are, those are flakes. And then they were preserved by packing them in salt. Through my childhood, our biggest family celebrations were feasts of salt cod and pork scrunchions. And this is how Barclay applies the preservative quality of salt to Christian discipleship. He wrote, if a Christian is to be the salt of the earth, he must have a certain antiseptic influence on life. He must be the person who by his presence defeats corruption and makes it easier for others to be good. One of the longest shadows that has been, so far at least, cast across the Olympic Games in Sochi is the new Russian law which imposes strict limits on speech and other freedoms based on sexual orientation. Governments and sports organizations have been challenged to boycott the games or to find some other way to protest Russia's latest attempt at institutionalizing discrimination. Lately, the focus has shifted to the corporations which are the official sponsors of these games. While many have condemned them for that association, Others are calling on those companies to use their influence to speak out, 
You may have seen the ad during the Super Bowl game called It's Beautiful. It's an ad in which Coca-Cola tries to do just that, to use its influence. It may have little effect on the Russians, but such an action might just make it easier for some others to be good. Another quality of salt, and this one is known to every generation, is that it lends flavor. According to Barclay, Christianity is to life what salt is to food. Christianity lends flavor to life. When she was herself a child, Betty's mother, Edith, could be a challenge for her parents. Now, I could say she could also be a challenge for her son-in-law, but that wouldn't be fair. She could be a challenge for her parents, especially when, when they were visiting one of their stiff-necked and sober-minded Salvation Army relations. That's not a family picture. I found, I found that someplace else. On their way home, after spending time with an aunt who was known for equating piety with strict and unsmiling melancholy, the child was lectured on the perils of bad behavior, and in particular that it might compromise her chances of going to heaven. She immediately replied that if aunt so-and-so is going to heaven, she'd rather head the other way. <laughs> the great Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, <clears throat> I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I know had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. Christianity has so often been practiced in a way that tastes more like vinegar than salt. That's what happens when the values of our faith are defined by what we are against rather than what we are for. That's what happens when we forget that the teachings of Jesus were life-affirming, that, that his commandment was love, that his promise was life that is full, joy that's complete, peace beyond understanding. Barclay put it this way, wherever they are, if they are to be the salt of the earth, Christians must be diffusers of joy. Poor Fred was looking sad. His friend Joe asked what was wrong. Well, said Fred, I'm in big trouble at home, and, and I don't know exactly what I did wrong. Tell me what happened, invited Joe. My wife asked me if I would still love her when she gets old and fat and wrinkly. And of course, you said you will. That's what I did, moaned Fred. Except I said, I do. As Fred should have known, we have it in our power to make people feel better. And we can just as easily make them feel worse. We can lift their spirits with affirmation, encouragement, and hope. Or we can push them down with criticism and discouragement and negativity. We can be like flavor-lending salt for others. Or not. After using the metaphor of salt, Jesus gave us the extraordinary compliment of entrusting us with responsibility to assume what had until then been his role exclusively to be light for the world. Earlier in his ministry, you remember, Jesus had said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But now he turned over that responsibility to people like you and me. Now you are light for the world. He said, Rukin is a small town in Norway situated between steep mountains. For six months every year, the town is shrouded in semi-darkness as the surrounding mountains cast their long shadow. During the winter, the only way the residents of Rukin can get a dose of sunlight is to take a cable car to the top of one of those ridges. That is, until last year. On a cold day last October, the entire town gathered in the market square to experience what was for them a miracle. For the first time ever at that time of the year, sunlight, sunlight reached the market square. Here's what happened. A local artist devised a plan to install three gigantic mirrors high on the mountain. The solar-powered computer-controlled mirrors steadily track the movement of the sun across the sky, reflecting its rays down into the town and bathing it in bright sunlight. 
As much as we may be tempted to think otherwise, the light does not originate with us. At best, we are reflectors of that light, which is Jesus Christ. But like those mirrors in Norway, there is so much that we reflectors can accomplish. Do you ever feel sorry for Prince Charles? Now, I know he's rich and heir to the throne and all that, but Charles has not had an easy time of it. For much of his adult life, he had been mocked as weak or silly when he was not being vilified as foil to the people's princess, Diana. His mother has made it abundantly clear that she has no intentions of abdicating and she remains stubbornly healthy. Opinion polls regularly rank him as far less popular than either his mother or his son, more less popular even than his, his daughter-in-law now. In fact, there is open discussion of the desirability of skipping Charles altogether and letting William succeed his grandmother. In terms of royal authority, Charles may one day claim the light which comes with the throne, but he has so far been only a reflector of that light. According to a recent Time magazine profile of the prince by Catherine Mayer, Charles has quietly used his reflector status to accomplish great things. For example, she writes, <clears throat> He not only serves as patron of 428 charities, but over the years has founded more than 25 charities of his own. Even his staff has lost track of exactly how many as well as the Prince of Charles Charitable Foundation. He spearheads nine awareness-raising initiatives, including Accounting for Sustainability, which urges the business and public sector to factor environmental impacts into every decision. Charles established his first charity, the Prince's Trust, in 1976. Over its 37-year history, it has given... 650,000 young men and women financial and practical assistance to start businesses or to embark on careers. So effective has he been at reflecting that light which is his birthright, Meyer says of him, he was born to wear a crown, but Prince Charles has long aimed higher. Jesus said, to those who were with him that day, but we can be pretty sure he, he meant it exactly the same for you and me. He said, you are salt of the earth. You are light for the world. You can, he said, you can, we can, we must aim that high. Wednesday afternoon, my own little world was pretty dark. During those five hours on the highway and when I arrived to deal with the police, the only salt I cared about was what I wished had been spread on the highway. <laughs> but then my world was illuminated by an officer who chose to be kind and who was, in that moment, for me at least, salt of the earth. In the name of the one we claim to serve, for the sake of all the good we might do, you and I can, we must aim that high. Amen.